before we kick off, Piyush, I want to get a sense of the uh, opinion among the audience. We'll have a poll question for you. And I think the, po the first poll question should be on the uh, future of bank branches. So please feel free to uh, express your views on that. And while we wait, I should encourage you, if you're tweeting about the event, please do tweet about the event to use the hashtag uh, STYT sooner than you think. Um, that would be really, uh, really appreciate your input on social media. So our bank branch is headed for extension. Let's see what the, uh, as we give the results a second or two to come in, and then we'll put the, uh, there you go, Piers. How about that? 60-40. Does that sound about right to you? You know, these questions are trick questions because they don't put a time frame on the question. So if you ask me over the next 10 years, I'd say they're unlikely to be extinct. Um, it's interesting that the, the shape and format of the branches will change. The number of branches will change. Uh, but I don't think branches will disappear in that time frame. In Sweden, which has made the most progress towards going cashless and reduction of branches, uh, the parliament has set up a committee, a commission, just a month ago, two months ago, uh, because there's pushback from society about mm. not having enough branches. Right? So I think you'll find some resistance. If the question is 20 years from now, then you're questioning the future of money itself, you're questioning video technologies, and so you might find a different answer in a 20-year time frame. Okay, well, there's plenty of points there. Maybe we can return to those later. But can you set out the soul, Piyush? You're on the front line. You're running a bank credit as being very successful in the in innovation space. How do you see it? Are we in the middle of a digital banking war right now? Well, you know, the reality, of course, the short answer is yes. Uh, but the reality is business has always been about competition. And, you know, Michael Porter, competitive advantage and creative destruction. Uh, so this is just another form of uh, competition, competition and uh, creative destruction. Uh, the digital technologies are different to the extent that they cause a blurring across industry lines. So earlier you had silos, you had competition within the industry, and now you have competition which comes from left field. So to that extent, the competitive landscape is changing a little bit. Uh, but I've always thought of uh, business as a competitive endeavor, and uh, therefore, you know, war is one way of describing it, I guess. And I guess in the case of Singapore, in particular, you're seeing competition from technology companies, right? Non-native players in the traditional banking or payment system space. Uh, are you seeing increased... In competition from some of those big Chinese names, Tencent and, and Financial and the like, are they you know, encroaching on what might be traditional banking space? Actually, you're seeing some of that in Singapore as well. You're seeing that around the world. Uh, actually, it's quite clear in the last five, seven years, the banking value chain is being unbundled. So whether it's payments or credit or you know, funds, uh, investments and so on. Uh, but I think there are two kinds of players in this new uh, space new world. 99% uh, of the players are the small startup fintechs. Uh, by and large, I think most of them will wind up being collaborators with existing incumbent players. And the reason for that is while they found and figured a new way of doing something, they still have a very important uh, handicap, and that is uh, the challenge of acquiring customers. Mm -hmm. Customer acquisition is expensive, and so for most of the smaller fintechs, it's much easier to go and plug into an existing bank customer base and work with the bank. Then you have the residual 1%. Uh, the 1% are the tech fins, the platform companies. They are the WeChats, the Alibabas, the Googles, the Amazons, and Facebooks. Uh, they're somewhat different because they already have a customer base. And they're sitting on half a billion, a billion customers. So they don't have the challenge of customer acquisition. And that makes them a far more potent force uh, in a competitive frame. So I think you will find a different degree of competitive intensity coming from some of these uh, big players. Uh, many of the Chinese names you mentioned have obviously scaled up a lot in China. Uh, it's quite uh, clear that they're now beginning to uh, stretch themselves outside of China. And Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, is an important playing field uh, for them. Uh, so we do see greater competitive intensity uh, from that standpoint. Uh, that having been said, I think there are two things which are worth also uh, reflecting on. One is that incumbents like ourselves don't come to this battleground unarmed. We do have some things going for us. Uh, if we're smart, we can leverage some of those strengths. Uh, and second, some of the tailwinds, the advantages these companies had in China, uh, a degree of regulatory arbitrage, if you will, 
uh, it's hard to replicate that outside your home country market. Right. Uh, so what are some of those weapons then that you talk about? What can you bring to the party and how do you respond to all of this? Well, first of all, uh, there's the knowledge of the business of banking. Um, and it might sound simple, but banking is a fairly complex and arcane thing, and particularly in a world of regulation, understanding how the regulatory uh, edifice plays out uh, is important. Uh, if you talk to most of the big tech firms, they tell you we don't want to be a bank because we don't want to deal with this. Uh, but the fact is that given the nature of the activities, they do start encroaching into regulated activities. Banks are better at that, at least for now. Uh, I think the infrastructure. Banks have typically been plugged into the payment and settlement infrastructure around the world. So we are the pipes. Uh, you could wind up being dumb pipes like the telcos, but you could not. And if you're smart, you could use that infrastructural advantage to be able to do things which are a lot more expensive for tech companies to do. Uh, the understanding of risk and risk management, a lot of new tech companies come up with the new underwriting models, a uh, way to take risk. Uh, the truth is it's easy to take risk in good times, uh, but we've all seen risk models tend to fall apart in down cycles. Uh, banks have been through cycles, so understanding both credit risk but liquidity risk, market risk, etc., is something that we're good at. So we do have some strengths. Uh, what we're generally weak at, we're not nimble. Our technology tends to be backward. We tend to be burdened by legacy systems. Uh, but those are not things that cannot be changed or addressed. Well, given the strengths and weaknesses then, does that mean there's a middle ground? Do you ever envisage DBS signing up for a partnership with one of these big companies? We're always open to partnership. In fact, one of the big changes in banking uh, is banks are switching from being uh, pipe companies, pipeline companies, a, a bilateral relationship with the, from a bank to the customer, to increasingly being partner companies. And so today we have partnerships with all kinds of people, partnerships for customer acquisition, for credit underwriting, for you know, creating new value propositions. So absolutely, we, I, I envisage all kinds of partnerships. Uh, sometimes partnerships are difficult to put together because the value exchange between partners is not easy to work through. Uh, an obvious partnership which people have always talked about between telcos and banks. But there have been very few successful partnerships between telcos and banks because people have found it hard to make that value exchange work. And bank assurance, I guess, is a, is a traditional example of. Uh, so, I mean, can you put any more color on that? I, I mean, are you actively looking for a partnership with a big tech company at the moment? Do you, see, do you see avenues where you could, in the near term, sign up with some kind of an agreement with you know, tech company X? Or are you just speaking kind of as longer term? No, no, we actually have a lot of, in fact, um, you know, some time ago we created a partner organization because we realized we're going to have to start working with partners. And as we're launching and expanding our business in big countries, markets like Indonesia and India, we're actively doing that through several partnerships. We have a partnership with a telco in Indonesia, for example. Uh, we have a partnership with a large taxi company in um, uh, India, for example. In uh, Singapore, in the last year, we have now launched a property marketplace. We've launched a car marketplace. We've launched an electricity marketplace. Uh, we are the PayPal to Carousel for this thing. And in each of these marketplaces, we have partnered with existing players because we don't need to recreate stuff. So as long as we can have a decent value exchange, uh, as I described, you can work with them. So we are actively working with all kinds of partners. And including with the bigger tech companies? Uh, we have some uh, arrangements with the bigger tech companies, but in pockets. We yeah. don't have a large, uh, uh, broad arrangement with anybody. And that's one area to zone in on. Is that an area where you think you could see collaboration going forward? Yes, of course you could, absolutely. Now, can you give us a sense in terms of what all this means for your R&D and your, your CapEx spend at the moment? How does, uh, you know, how does your spend compare this year compared to previous years, and what are your projections for going forward and, and spending in this area? Well, you know, we spend about a billion dollars every year on technology. And till a few years ago, the bulk of that, you know, 70, 80% of that, 90%, was spent on keeping the lights on, you know, keeping the data center running, etc. So we were lucky to spend maybe a couple of hundred million bucks on new stuff, the developmental stuff. One of the great things about new technology is if you transfer and shift your technology architecture to what I call the modern stack, cloud uh, native architecture, the cost of technology plummets. So we are using much smaller footprint in our data centers. We are giving up our large machines for small machines. We are giving up expensive bespoke uh, licensed software for um, uh, open source software. And because the cost of technology is coming down, we are able to divert some of the keep the lights on money to actually developmental money. 
So we've been able to keep a billion dollars flattish, but today almost half of that goes to new developmental capex as opposed to operating expenditure. It's an expensive business then, I guess. Well, it's, it's uh, uh, important money, but you have to understand that the, we get two kinds of uh, benefits. One, we are seeing obvious revenue upside. Our market shares are improving. We're also able to launch new products which we didn't have, which actually drop money to the bottom line. But equally, our expenses come down. Hmm. So if you get this uh, customer journey right, uh, you can actually do that at much better cost points. So our cost income ratios are improving. So it's obviously a worthwhile expenditure to make. Okay, Piers, I'd like to move to regulation, but I want to give the audience another chance to, uh, to weigh in with, with their thoughts with our next poll question, uh, if, it can go, if it can go on screen. And this one is about bank branches and your views on whether or not they have a future. Please do uh, cast your vote for that and let Piers know what you're thinking. Oh, sorry, cash making. Oh, there you go. So uh, I, have, I have to say, um, um, I think the Bloomberg questions are all a little bit short. The reality is digital has been king for the last 25 years. It's not will. If you think about the total money supply in a system, M1, which is currency in circulation, is zero. I mean, it's like less than 5%. All of the big money in the world is all in bank accounts, and we transfer digitally. We've transferred on SWIFT and digitally for the last 40 years. So this is not new news, this is old news. Mm. So what you're questioning is, at point of payment, you know, what is the shift between cash and other forms of payment? And even that, with credit cards, debit cards, and so on, a large part of that has already shifted to electronic channels. So then what you're talking about is, at the margin, are you going to see a further shift from currency notes and coins to other forms of settlement? And I think the answer to that is an unequivocal yes. In Singapore, the use of DBS, we're the biggest cash provider in Singapore, but use of cash is going down by about 5% a year already. And I think that will accelerate as you go forward. Uh, however, I don't think you'll get to zero because people like the option, uh, not just of convenience, but oftentimes of anonymity. Uh, just before I was talking to uh, uh, you, uh, you know, we wired up the National University of Singapore so you can basically use our payment to pay, our, to pay everywhere, in the tuck shop, for everything in the university. Uh, it was so successful, all the kids started just using PayLa for everything. Uh, and then the administration, as a consequence, uh, decided to issue a mandate saying from August this year, cash would no longer be allowed in the university. Uh, in 48 hours, they got 2,000 students who signed a petition saying that's not allowed, we need cash. Now, the reality is they don't use cash, but they don't want somebody to take cash away. So no. I think you're going to find some degree of resistance from people who want either the convenience or the anonymity. But I do think use of the cash will reduce. That's the minority in our, in our voting poll there. That's hanging it. on. Uh, regulation, Piers, some policymakers have expressed concern that we're seeing these new players who are not being regulated the way traditional bankers are, but they're playing in the traditional banking space. Do you think that's a debate that needs to be had? Do you think if these guys want to move into the payments and settlement space, then they've got to be regulated just like a bank does? Absolutely. And I mean, of course, I'm speaking my book, but uh, uh, absolutely. I remember I had this interesting conversation with a regulator in China a few years ago and asked them why they would not regulate Alibaba as a bank because they raise money like a bank, they lend money like a bank, they move money around like a bank, they do insurance like a bank. And I said, you know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a bank. Uh, and he said, quite uh, interestingly, uh, I agree with you. The problem is first they were too small, now they're too big. Uh, that's not an appropriate response for me. And frankly, in the last year or so, you can see even in China, the regulators are beginning to come around to a recognition that you cannot continue this regulatory discrepancy, I call it regulatory arbitrage. Uh, you do need to think about financial system stability, and you do need to think about the consequences of unregulated players in what has been, for good reasons, a regulated industry. Uh, you will find across the world that regulators are a little more thoughtful, therefore, about uh, what they wish to do. Uh, but what a lot of regulators are looking at doing, which I think you'll find some currency with, I think even though it's somewhat flawed, is what they call proportionate regulation. So you will regulate entities for the nature of the activity they perform, and it might not all be the same level of uh, regulation. Um, and, you know, so, so activity-based regulation as opposed to entity-based regulation. Uh, I think in the long term, even that might not be adequate. I think people will have to give it some thought. Do you expect any progress on that front among regulators? 
I mean, there's a big meeting in Bali next month, for example. Do you think it'll be something that's going to be discussed by the central bankers? I think it's an evolution. At uh, one of the meetings of the global regulators in Singapore a few months ago, uh, this conversation came to the table, and the regulatory view was we are paid to regulate the banks. We're not paid to regulate the non-banks. Mm. So maybe this is not in our remit. Uh, I think it's going to take some time to evolve when people start thinking about the idea that you're paid to keep the financial system stable. Mm. And just because you squeeze the balloon on one side and parts of the balloon go out within your current remit doesn't mean that you can ignore it. You still have to get your eyes around it or get your arms around it at some stage. Mm. Okay, Peter, I want to ask you about the hu human, human cost of all of this, regardless of one's views on the merits or otherwise of technology. Uh, on the one side, people like a human touch when it comes to their loans and savings. Uh, and on the other side, of course, banks are big generators of employment in economies around the world. What are the human consequences of this road towards AI and automated banking? It's not just banking, of course, but we're, that's the topic we're focusing on today. What's the human cost of all of this and the, and the economic cost, do you think, around the world? So I, I you know, do these sessions and I sometimes joke that these, I'm kind of schizophrenic on the issue and you get two for the price of one. Uh, on the one hand, as you suggested, we are obviously leaders in the digital transformation because I think it's very beneficial fundamentally. You can improve customer choices and customer experience. What you buy, what you get, when you get it. And frankly, that's why customers vote with their feet for all of the new ways of doing things. Uh, at the same time, the other side of me reflects on the broader social issues that you mentioned. I do think that some of the consequences for the new way of living have not been thought through adequately. There's not enough thinking around what does it mean if an autonomous driving vehicle kills somebody who's responsible. There's not enough thinking around data and data privacy issues, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. There's not enough thinking about the right of the individual versus the benefits to society. So I think we as society are going to have to reimagine the new rules of living. I call it the new rules of the new order. And that's going to take up a lot of time and effort over the next decade or two. I think, frankly, in some ways, the liberal arts and psychology and philosophy are going to find a renaissance because those are going to guide us as society and mankind to what's an appropriate way to live in this new age. More specifically to your question, you know, we're very thoughtful, therefore, that when we're talking about new opportunities for customers, we have to think about those customers who can't leverage this. Mm. How do we deal with the old timers? How do we deal with people who don't have the facility to do this easily? How do we create easy transition paths or even leave a large part of our infrastructure just to handle some of that uh, uh, problem? Mm. You take branches we spoke of. I could dramatically cut my branches today. I don't do it because we believe DBS is a social role to play. Mm. And so we've got to be thoughtful about what does it mean for the marginalized individual in the HDB estate. Mm. Similarly for our employees, we were very conscious day one that there's some jobs which are going to get dislocated. And uh, we have to be very thoughtful about what do we do with those kinds of employees. So we created a skill, a reskilling program and a conversion program very early. In fact, we identified 1,500 people in our branches and in our operations, most likely to be impacted. Mm. And we created a reskilling program, but today I'm very proud that half of them have been reassigned to new parts of the bank because we work with them. Yeah. But you have to be conscious about this, otherwise you will create this massive underbelly of people who are disenfranchised with this change. And that's not going to be good for society. And, and that debate isn't being sufficiently had, I think, at the moment as well. Can we pull up our last poll question, please? Because we're almost right out of time. This one will be to sum up the views of the audience having heard Piers speaking. And it's, who's going to win the digital war, banks or big tech? Now, while they're voting, Piers, um, are we on track for an automated bank CEO? Is your job going to be automated in coming years? Well, I, hard to say. I'm not sure it's going to happen again in the next 10, 20 years. It goes back to when you have artificial general intelligence, and like Harari says, you sort of abdicate all thinking to a machine, it could happen. Uh, but I think my success will be human being. Um, and who wins the digital wars, banks or big tech? I think the, the people who win the digital wars are the people who can provide the best customer experiences. Hmm. And I don't think it will be one or the other. I think if you are smart and good as a bank, but you can transform and provide good digital experiences, I think you will survive. If you cannot create good experiences, you will die. 
Uh, similarly, you can be a great tech company, but if you cannot engage and create a better consumer experience, that won't necessarily make you a good bank. Piyush, I want to finish, because um, we're out of time. You've just won best bank in the world, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, what does that mean for Piyush Gupta? What's the future hold for you? Do you see yourself uh, in a role beyond banking at some point, being the thinker, being the lead, thought leader on some of these issues that we've just discussed? And well, first of all, I enjoy banking. I'm a good banker. But, you know, Singapore is a great country. It gives you a unique platform to participate in mul multiple dimensions. Uh, the minister this morning spoke about this... Uh, a council we're creating to think about some of the ethical issues around artificial intelligence and data. And I put my hand up to be in the council because I worry about this issue of what does the future hold for society and mankind. So I do have the opportunity to play with some of these things uh, while doing my bank job. So best of both worlds, I guess. I see. Fair enough. We'll have to leave it there. Piers, thank you so much for your time. Please thank Piers for coming along today. Yes.